Hello and welcome to recording in Canby. progress. Hello and welcome to Canby Planning Commission, uh, dated Monday, June 26, 2023. Uh, please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, moving into our consent items, uh, I will entertain a motion to adopt final findings for the Fourth Avenue Five Plex project uh, labeled DR 23 01 forward slash VAR 23 01. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we uh, approve DR 2301 and VAR 2301 as submitted. Do we have a second? I second. We're, all right, we'll take a roll call vote, uh, starting to my left with uh, Mr. Llewellyn. Approve. Uh, Commissioner Jarosh. Approve. I approve. Approve. I approve. Very well. Uh, the motion to, or I'm sorry, the consent item for approval of DR 23-01, VAR 23-01 is approved by a vote of five to zero. Moving on to citizen input and non-agenda items. This is an opportunity for members of the public to address the Planning Commission on non-agenda items. Each person will be given three minutes to speak. Staff and the Planning uh, Commission will make every effort to respond to questions raised during citizens' input before the meeting ends or as quickly as possible. Do we have any citizen input on non-agenda items? No. Going once, going twice, very well. Uh, new business, uh, we have none. And public hearings, we have none. Uh, at this point, we are going to move into our Planning Commission work session. The purpose of tonight's session is to give the Planning Commission the opportunity to discuss the sequential urban growth boundary, UGB, uh, adoption process. To make the most of the short time we are given for these work sessions, public comment will not be taken. Instead, we invite the public uh, at, a, I'm sorry, instead we invite public comment at all the Planning Commission's regular meetings under either of the two opportunities dedicated on each agenda for public comment. In addition, we invite the public <clears throat> to contact city staff with comments or concerns. Although this is a public meeting, the Planning Commission cannot make any formal decision in a work session. Next step actions are often determined for deliberation and discussion at a properly noticed Planning Commission hearing. Mr. Potter, are you uh, going to take it from here? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Chair Ellison and Planning Commissioners. Um, tonight we are going to have a work session and presentation. Um, this is a topic that Don has alluded to several times uh, with this body, um, and it's an aspect of our comprehensive plan update of which um, you guys are very familiar, but this is a sequential adoption process for our comp plan update. And in a nutshell, that's basically rather than waiting until the very end of the process and trying to get a bunch of documents and work products and processes all adopted at once, you're basically peeling off pieces of it and sequentially adopting them through your decision makers. So uh, tonight we all give a very brief overview of the topic. Um, and the benefits of the process. Um, then I will turn it over to Kelly Reed, who's visiting us from uh, DLCD, the uh, Department of Land Conservation and Development. Uh, she's graciously uh, offered to uh, come and speak with us. Uh, obviously, DLCD, they're the experts. They're the agency that um, these processes all go through. Um, and of particular note, there's another, another local jurisdiction that's gone through the sequ sequential process or they've at least started it. Um, and so that's definitely a resource for us as we go down that path. 
uh, after Kelly um, presents, then I'll speak a little bit more on the components of our process and the timing that we're sort of anticipating that we would uh, process those under this process. So these slides of John's are, are very text heavy. I'm not going to I'm not going to read all these, uh, but basically, you know the the work products that you've already seen, which are the EOA and the HNA, have showed as you shown as you've seen that we are running out of land. So for both residential and non-residential uh, development, we're obviously, we have a deficit and the city's gonna need to grow our, our urban growth boundary uh, to accommodate the growth that we're projecting over the next 20 years. And so how you do that is you amend your urban growth boundary. And, um, What's cool about this new process that um, the state has uh, created is it's meant to create some predictability. And that's, uh, like I alluded to before, it's you're not waiting until the very end um, to try to take this gigantic package of things to your decision makers because it's very overwhelming and so many things can you know change throughout the process. So it's re it's taking it more step by step. Uh, DLCD is recommending uh, that we do this uh, process. So this tool is available to us. And there's uh, Oregon administrative rules um, that provide the framework for how it all works. Uh, the, the benefits to this way of doing it, um, it limits appeals um, because the different pieces are separated out and that's not meant to prevent people from appeal, appealing parts of it. You can still appeal, but the appeals can be limited to the piece that you're adopting at that particular time. And so, for example, if there's a bunch of assumptions that's in your housing needs assessment, it's better to discuss and debate the assumptions for that document at the beginning, right before you're gonna adopt it, rather than get all the way to the end when you're trying to do an urban growth boundary amendment um, that's based on all those previous pieces. And so you're really getting the scrutiny on the individual pieces as you go through it. Um, it also allows us to vest um, with the population forecasts that we're using. Um, and this is one of the delicate things that Don has worked um, through over the last six months is trying to get the exact timing of all the pieces right because you don't want to have your um, demographic uh, pr projections and assumptions expire and then you would have to start all over again um, because you're using different assumptions. And so we can kind of get those solidified up front. And then a benefit of this is um, we'll be working with Clackamas County and DLCD, and so they'll be working with us hand in hand um, throughout, um, which will give them additional opportunities to kind of give buy-in into the in the into the way that we're doing it. Um, and so now I will turn it over to Kelly, um, who has a presentation uh, for us. Hi, I'm Kelly Reed, uh, and thank you for having me tonight. Thank you, Ryan, um, and Don, if you're watching. I uh, hope you're not. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, so I am your regional representative from the Department of Land Conservation and Development. Um, so that's the State Land Use Planning Agency. Uh, and I've been with the department for about 11 months now. Previously, I was a planner in Oregon City. So I've kind of sat where Ryan is sitting uh, for, for a long time. Um, 
And now I get to work with all the Ryans um, uh, in Clackamas County and in Multnomah County um, and with all the planning commissions. Um, and so uh, my job as a, as a regional representative is to kind of bring the state resources to the local jurisdiction. So we, we um, award grants for planning work. So Canvey has uh, two grants right now, one for the housing needs analysis, one for the economic opportunity analysis. Um, we do technical assistance as well, um, provide model code, um, and then uh, you know we do have a review um, role when it comes to urban growth boundary um, amendments and some other uh, land use actions that typically don't come up in in um, cities like Canby. Um, and then the other part of my job is really kind of bringing local issues and what's happening on the ground, bringing that information back to the state so that in Salem, they kind of understand what's happening and what the needs are around the state. Um, okay, I've got my slides up, thank you. Um, so uh, there is, you know, like Ryan said, you did a really good job um, explaining the sequential process. There's the standard urban growth boundary amendment process and then there's this new kind of sequential method of doing it. The analysis that you do, to um, figure out how and where to expand your urban growth boundary is the same for both. So I'm gonna kind of go through just a UGB expansion kind of explanation of how that works. Um, and then, uh, you know, talk a little bit about the sequential part of it, but I think Ryan covered most of that. Um, and I have some background information too, so bear with me. It just, I think it helps to kind of set the context and kind of bring it all together. And I'll try not to take too much time. All right, oh, here we go, sorry. Um, okay, so DLCD, again, uh, we were created by Senate Bill 100 in 1973. Um, the Land Conservation Development Commission is the you know, decision-making body, and then DLCD is the staff, the, the staff people. Um, so we're charged by the legislature with managing urban growth, protecting farm and forest land, uh, coastal areas, natural resources, and then working with local governments to make their communities more livable and do good planning work. Uh, so here are your seven LCDC uh, commissioners. They're appointed by the governor. They represent um, areas throughout the state of Oregon. Uh, so the um, Land Conservation Development Commission in the 70s adopted uh, all the statewide planning goals. Um, actually, I think goals 16 through 19 were adopted a little bit later, but um, the, we kind of put these goals into, into buckets. So first you've got your process goals. Uh, how do we do planning? Goal one, citizen involvement is really, it's goal one, it's most important, right? First on the list. Um, and then we have our rural lands goals that apply to ag and forest lands. Uh, and then we have our urban goals, uh, recreation, economic development, housing, public facilities, transportation, energy conservation, and urbanization. Urbanization is kind of what we're talking about today. How do you t transition land from rural to urban? Uh, and then your constraints goals. So this is about land that has um, physical constraints. Um, so wetlands, streams, uh, floodplain, uh, steep slopes, uh, landslide hazard risk, um, all those kind of categories. So DLCD has rules um, for most of these goals. Um, and then statutes and rules, um, just like you have your own zoning code. Okay, so goal 14, urbanization. Um, uh, really, really just, this is the goal that established urban growth boundaries uh, for every community, or every city in the, in the state. Um, and then uh, set the rules for what can happen inside the urban growth boundary and then what can happen outside. Uh, so we did, um, some uh, number crunching last year to kind of look at what, how is it going in the state, statewide with jurisdictions who are trying to amend their urban growth boundaries. And so um, in from 2016 through 2022, there were 38 uh, UGB amendments, 36 of those were successful. Um, and, and so that's a 95% approval rate. Um, as you know, all of these things can be appealed, right, to LUBA and beyond. Um, so 83% of those were not appealed. Um, and then 80% uh, were approved within one year of local adoption. So the go local government adopted it and then it went to DLCD and DLCD approved it um, w within the year. Um, so, so cities are 
all over the state, you know, are working on on this and are be successful in in expanding or amending their urban growth boundaries as needed. Um, so Canby's urban growth boundaries shown here. Uh, you have, of course, your city limits is a little bit smaller than that. So there's still some land that hasn't been annexed yet. Um, um, but you can see uh, there that you know, and there's some. If you look closely, you can see some of that vacant kind of farmland that still hasn't been developed. Maybe some of it's been annexed and some of it hasn't. Um, so really what, you're, what you've been looking at um, with the work you've been do, doing recently um, is, you know, what's your land supply and then what's your land, future land needs um, based on future demand for new housing and jobs. Um, so. I pulled this from your buildable lands inventory. So, um, with your with both of those those documents, you're working on the economic opportunity analysis and the housing needs analysis. You look at all of your employment land and all of your residential land. What's developed? What's vacant? How many acres do we have um, that's buildable, developable? And you know, take away the wetland areas and the steep slopes if you have any. I don't know. In Canby, you don't have much of that. But um, and then what's left and you know, there's your buildable land inventory. Um, this is from your economic opportunity analysis. So this just shows the employment lands um, in Canby that are uh, either vacant or partially vacant. Um, and then you did another, a separate map for your housing for your residential lands. Um, so really that's exactly what you have to do. The first step to a, a UGB amendment is, you know, let's take a look at our land need. Um, so you do the housing capacity, your housing needs analysis, the EOA, and then um, I don't know that Canby's doing this, but other cities, you, you can do this. Um, you can do public facility studies if you have very specific needs for um, like a, a specific public facility, like a new sewer plant, or maybe it's um, a, a new high school, um, something that requires a lot of land, then that might go feed into your, your analysis as well. Uh, the other thing that you can do, which I believe Canby is doing, is just assume 25% um, of the, for residential lands, you just kind of add 25% to account for all of the infrastructure needs, streets, parks, schools, things like that. So um, I pulled these numbers from your from your housing needs analysis and your EOA. Um, so you do expect quite a bit of growth in the next 20 years, um, and and all of this is based on 20 years, right? So when we're forecasting, um, you know, goal 14 uh, of the statewide planning goal says you need to ha have land for 20 years worth of growth. Um, so that's why all of this is based on 20 years. Um, so 200. 2,262 additional housing units um, will be needed, and then um, space for almost 7,000 jobs. Um, and, and based on your BLI, um, you've determined that you don't actually have ample land to accommodate all of this growth. Um, so before you then jump to an urban growth boundary amendment, though, um, you have to take a look at efficiency measures. So with the land that we already have in our urban growth boundary, is there a way we can use it more efficiently so that um, we can accommodate more of that growth within the existing urban growth boundary? So some communities um, can do a lot and some kind of have already you know, done everything they can and really there's not, not a whole lot to, that they can do. Um, but it, it's an important step in the process. And um, one of the examples is up here on the slide, it's middle housing. Um, so of course, you know, using land more efficiently, efficiently means maybe smaller lots and smaller units so you can fit more in a, on a piece of land. Um, and I think one of the efficiency measures that can be, uh, that you all are looking at is actually um, cottage clusters, which is uh, considered middle housing. Um, and would be, you know, it's a great example of an efficiency measure that you can take um, to, you know, legalize that and prior, or, you know, encourage that type of development um, uh, to, to have a more efficient land use pattern and compact um, housing types. Um, so once you've, up zoning is another one, so you can you can rezone land from maybe medium density to high density. Um, maybe you can reduce lot sizes. So any everything to kind of preserve, because we're trying to balance, right, providing housing and also protecting farm and forest land. So um, striking that balance is, you know, everyone's gonna perceive that a little bit differently, right? But um, 
um, but you'll have to kind of explain how you've done that. Um, so the steps in the UGB expansion. Uh, first, you determine your study area. So you look within one mile outside of your existing UGB, um, and then for certain types of land, you go one and a half miles. So here's an example from City of Sandy. They drew their one mile boundary and then their uh, one and a half mile buffer. Um, and you'll see in, actually, let me go back. Um, I'm showing this county zoning map. Um, so everything outside of Canby, it's kind of hard to see the colors here, but um, most of that is exclusive farm use. So that's agricultural, agricultural land, as you know. Um, there's a little bit of um, timber zoning up by Mawala State Park. Um, and then uh, you've got some of those kind of tan areas um, or brown, maybe light brown. Um, those are your exception lands. So those are rural residential usually. So smaller, like five to 10 acre, maybe some smaller, like two acre lots um, that were mostly established before Senate Bill 100. Um, and so they were given an exception to the kind of agricultural or the rural um, rules um, to have residential uses outside the urban growth boundary. So in on this map, those green, light green areas are Sandy's exception lands, um, just to give you that context. Uh, the other thing you want to look at is um, rural reserves and urban reserves. So Canby doesn't have any urban reserves. You haven't identified, in the past, you've never um, gone through a process to identify, you know, here's our urban reserve, meaning this is the area where we're gonna grow into, um, is our first priority. Um, so because you don't have an urban reserve, then um, you're looking at two categories. You have rural reserve, which is shown in green, and you have undesignated, um, which is the white areas outside of the red line. And, and so those are the areas that are available to you to expand into with your urban growth boundary amendment. So step two is to prioritize uh, the entire study area. Um, so first you look, uh, urban reserves don't have those, so your rural exception lands, those brown areas with rural residential, um, anything that's not, resource, not a resource. So if it's not a farm and not forest, it, that's the first priority to expand into. Um, the second one only applies to Lane and Washington counties. Third, um, farm and forest land that's not primarily high value, and that's based on the soil type. Um, for the most part. Um, and then uh, fourth priority, so last priority, is those high value farm and forest lands, which, as you know, there are a lot of those surrounding Canby um, and, you know, then, then down into French Prairie as well. So step three is applying suitability criteria. Um, so the first example, industrial uses you have a, lot, a big land need for industrial uses, right? And a lot of industrial uses tend to want large parcels, right? 20 acres maybe, you know, 10, 20, 30 acre sites. Um, if, you're, if the land that you're looking at is divided up already into t small parcels, um, like one and two acre parcels, that's not gonna work. Um, for, I mean, that would be difficult to assemble that land, get all the property owners on the, you know, together to sell it to someone and then make, and make it industrial. So, you know, that's kind of the analysis that you can do to, to determine if that area is appropriate for an expansion for industrial purposes. Um, there, and then, you know, you're looking at what natural resources are on the land, streams, wetlands, um, any steep slopes, are there easements on the property, is, are, is there a church or anything like that outside of the urban growth boundary. So then you're kind of looking site specific at this, at this point in step three. Um, and then in step four, this is uh, really kind of the hard part, I think. Um, it's just striking that balance of efficient land use. You know, how, how easy is it to get the infrastructure out there? You know, thinking about sewer lines and roads. Um, you know, really looking at what are the environment, environmental consequences of an expansion in that particular area, and then what's the compatibility of, of that, or what's the impact on the nearby farm farm uses and um, forest lands. Um, so, so again, right, this is really subjective, and this is really where it gets, um, I think, difficult. 
So the adoption process. Um, initiated by the city, um, but the city and the county have to both adopt the UGB expansion. Um, so you've, your staff's already reached out to Clackamas County, they're you know, getting on board. Um, and so once uh, it comes to planning commission and your city council for adoption um, as a comprehensive plan amendment, then it would go to the county and they would adopt it as well. Um, uh, and then it goes to my department, DLCD. Um, normally, the standard UGB expansion process is it goes to the commission um, for review if it's more than 50 acres, um, but the sequential process is a little bit different. So the way the sequential process works is, like Ryan said, you, you can adopt your housing needs analysis, your economic opportunity analysis, and your efficiency measures all as separate actions. So each one of those is appealable, um, but if, if, it does, if it does get challenged or appealed, you sort that out, get through it, and then you can move on to the next step. Um, and so then at the end, when you're, uh, when you're expanding your urban growth boundary, the, um, if, if that is challenged, it can only be challenged on the basis of those four steps that we just talked about, and not like the analysis of the land, and not on the already adopted documents. Um, the three previous ones. Um, so each uh, each of those um, stages in the sequential process, um, once you adopt them, you send them to DLCD for review, um, and that's that would happen anyway, really. Um, so you'd send your your H and A and your EOA to us um, anyway, um, and so our director. Um, uh, you know, reviews and approves those, um, and you you have uh, a good amount of time, um, basically five years from the first task to get to the your final urban growth boundary amendment. So that was a lot, and I think that's my last slide. <laughs> um, and I, I zipped through it. So any any questions? I think our <clears throat> our planning staff has done a great job bringing us along. So a lot of the acronyms, thankfully, uh, <laughs> I was tracking with, I think, almost all of them. Um, so thank you for that. That just kind of puts a nice bow on the, on the next process, which I was trying to figure out what that would look like if we went to expand the urban growth boundary. So, mm -hmm. yeah. But thank, thank you very much. I appreciated that a lot. Anybody else? You're welcome. That's good. I have one quick question. So in the state's thought process, first question I have is, is why are they going to the sequential process versus what we did the last time we did this? So um, yeah, and can, I don't think Canby has ever expanded. You, you set your urban growth boundary in the 80s, and I don't think that you've expanded it since then. I might be wrong. Maybe a little, a small one, not a major one. Um, so I, I was not with the department when the sequential process was thought up, um, but my understanding is that there were other communities, I think in um, Yamhill County, that um, you know, had a really long drawn out process where they started with their housing needs analysis and then years and years and years, it took, everything took a long time. Um, and then they finally got to their urban growth boundary amendment that was based on this demonstration of housing need. And um, it was appealed based on some error or some something that someone wanted to challenge back, you know, from 15 years ago when they did this housing needs analysis. I, it might not be exactly 15 years, but it was a long time. So, um, so I think that the rules, the sequential process was written as a response to that, you know, as a, as a way for, um, for cities to have a little bit more control over, or, not control, but you know, a little more certainty that you know they can rely on information <laughs> from a document, um, so they can adopt it first and then um, and then move to the next step. Um, one of the rules for housing needs analysis is that you cannot adopt it unless you until you actually are providing um, 
the capacity for the housing that you've shown that's needed, right? So, so if you are can be and you do your housing needs analysis and you don't have capacity for all of that, um, then you're stuck and you can't adopt it. You have to wait. You have to expand your urban growth boundary, right? And so that can take so many years. So if you start the sequential process, though, where DLCD says, okay, you're you're on this path and um, you have this housing needs analysis, you can adopt it now. Um, and then kind of go on to the next. So it's not a huge difference in the process, but I think that in the event that there might be um, challenges to any of those actions that you're taking, it's it's less risky in some ways. Okay, well, that, what you said, I understand that. that. That kind of segues into my second question now, and that is population growth in the state of Oregon. Mm -hmm. Now that is all comes out of uh, the universe, Portland, Portland State University findings. Um, the numbers that we, when we very first started this, um, I've heard now that those numbers are not necessarily correct, that we're actually declining in population. So what is the state, I kind of saw the sequential mm -hmm. thing as a, a a way around, a workaround mm -hmm. around that because what we were going to base our, our findings on is not, is not good information anymore that, that the state has made a turnaround and we're actually going in a negative mm. way. Um, how is that going to affect our process? Because I don't, I don't think that we need to expand, I don't want to expand any more than we have to. Mm -hmm. um, it costs us. Mm -hmm. it, it's not necessarily a good thing for us to have a, a, a UGB expansion that we're not going to use. Mm -hmm. And so what's the state looking at yeah. where that's concerned? Well, I know P Portland State updates their forecasts, you know, and uses the newest and best information, you know, they update it regularly. Um, but, you know, you have to what, kind of... regularly? Excuse me, I interrupt. Um, I mean, is that it every, might be every three months, six months. No, I think it might be every two years or four years. Okay. Um, I, it might, probably two, but I'm not exactly sure. Okay. I can get back to you on that. Um, the, you know, but you're you're kind of choosing your you're you're basing everything on this one forecast, right? Because it's, you know, it goes out to um, 2042, right? And it's your 20 years, and so once you set that, you know. Um, it's it's there. Um, I guess what I'll say about the what I've heard. You know, I'm not an economist, but I there is a, a great you can subscribe to the State Economists um, blog posts and emails, and um, so there's been some information about the 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 decline mm -hmm. um, and those numbers from the census um, through through his office and. Um, I think what I remember reading is that it's really hard to predict. It, it, it's it's it could be an anomaly, right? We don't know until you have a few years of data to show actually a trend. It could just be like a little dip based on lots of factors, the pandemic, you know, and what have you. And then also it, you know, you're looking at the state as a whole, but that doesn't mean that every city is declining. There are still there are places that are shrinking and places that are growing, um, right? So Multnomah County is losing residents to Clark County in Washington and to Clackamas County, right? I think people are people are leaving Portland because they can't afford it for whatever you know and for other reasons, and um, and so they're you know, that might not really affect, or that's not gonna mean that can be is also declining, right? Can be actually might be taking in some of those folks who are who are migrating away. So um, I, I think it's just really complex and it's hard to, to say if that decline really means a whole lot for the state as a whole or for any particular jurisdiction. Okay, all right. But it, and, I'll, I'll buy a little bit of that. It, the numbers that I see show the state population in Oregon mm -hmm. declining mm -hmm. significantly. First time it's happened in 23 years. Right. And so as we step into this process, I begin to wonder, you know, granted, we might be getting people from Portland, you know, who wants to live in Portland, 
coming to Canby. Uh, we might be getting people coming from Vancouver coming to Canby, although I think it's the other way around. Um, I just, I just, I just, I'm a little bit mm -hmm. hesitant as we go mm -hmm. into this process that we're working with good numbers yeah. and that we don't expand more than what we need to because mm -hmm. it's, it's an expense to right. us as, as a local economy. So right. anyway. And I will say there are areas in um, in Metro Urban Growth Boundary, like around Oregon City, where I used to work, that have been in the Urban Growth Boundary since 2002, and they still haven't developed um, for various reasons, right? It's difficult to get infrastructure there. It's highly parcelized. You've got property owners that aren't really interested in, in developing their property. Um, so... Um, it, it it it's all it's always possible that you could expand the boundary and then not see as much development as you were expecting or that you're planning for. Um, the other thing I'll say is that if you want to reduce the amount of expansion, then efficiency measures are really there's your there's your game is. Yeah, like increasing the capacity within your existing urban growth boundary and figuring out how you can accommodate more housing closer in. Um, Develop your alleyways. <laughs> oh, <goodness. laughs> it was an inside joke. I'm sorry. I'm awesome. Thank you. That's all I have. Very good. Mr. Potter, anything else? Um, yes, I have a couple more slides, so we're going to switch back to the, gotcha. uh, the other presentation. Um, but I do want to thank Kelly. Uh, Kelly has been great. Um, she's been with us all throughout the process so far, um, and so we really appreciate her guidance. And DLCD in general has been really great. Um, they, I know Dawn is in constant contact with them, and um, they've been lots of help. Um, so just my last couple slides while Lainey's pulling them up are, are really just what are the, what's the process that we see going forward um, using this tool and then um, the actual components of what our uh, sequences will be. So it's okay. Um, I might just go ahead and, oh, oh here we go. Uh, so the components of the process, um, so uh, Kelly touched on this a little bit, but basically you create a work plan um, with DLCD and with the county that basically lays out what your plan is for, for doing this. So obviously there's a lot of pieces at play and so um, the city would be to work to get buy off um, from the other uh, jurisdictions. Um, so we would work with DLCD staff and also um, as Kelly mentioned, Don's already coordinating with uh, the county because obviously if you expand your boundary, you're you're expanding into the jurisdiction of Clackamas County. So they're an important um, stakeholder. Uh, Don has tentatively scheduled a work session for August 4th um, to discuss this issue um, and, and set council up for adopting a resolution um, th so that they would officially be endorsing all, us to move forward using a sequential um, comprehensive plan process. Um, and then Kelly talked about the, the county being involved. Um, 
so there, there's some process to that. And then ultimately, uh, DLCD would issue an approval of the work plan. And Don is planning that to be um, towards the end of this year before we start adopting individual pieces of it. Lainey, can you just go to the next slide if you can? Sorry about that, guys. Um, okay, so um, this is um, so basically this this last slide is just what are the actual pieces, and so these these are all things that you that you are all are very familiar with. You have your economic opportunity analysis, your EOA, which we've talked about quite a bit. Um, you have the H and A, the housing needs assessment, and the housing production strategy, which are sort of separate but related. Um, those are our two things that analysis that analyze our, our housing needs and um, how how we plan to accommodate those needs. And then we have our efficiency measures. That's what we've been talking about for the last few work sessions with Don. The right now the the efficiency measures that we have planned are the um, mixed use overlay along Highway 99, the cottage cluster, um, adding cl cottage cluster provisions to our zoning ordinance, and then um, the third is um, uh, enhancing our, our PUD um, parts of our code, which obviously, as we've discussed, we have a PUD section of our code, but it doesn't really get used. So um, right now, those are our, oh, thank you, Lee. Um, so I'll go back through these. So the, the EOA um, is tentatively scheduled. Um, Don is thinking for August um, and September um, to go through council of this year. Um, the HNA and HPS um, would be probably 2024. And then the efficiency measures would also be um, the first or second quarter of 2024. Obviously, we're already working on those, but this would be when they would get adopted. Um, and then eventually we get to our comprehensive plan update and, and our TSP update, which are the overarching biggest pieces of this whole thing. And then um, eventually the UGB amendment that reflects um, the need reflected in those previous documents, but also what we have planned in our comprehensive plan. Um, and my understanding is the work plan doesn't uh, finalize these dates as set in stone, um, and Kelly's nodding yes, um, but you do, the idea is you get a tentative schedule for how it could all work together. And I believe that is it. So that concludes our presentation. Um, so if there's any additional questions, I will attempt to answer them. Was that drop dead date again for not, you know, making sure that the the population number stays intact? Um, I'm not sure about that, but they're the 2020 numbers, I believe. I think it's June 2024 is the next release okay. date. So, we which part of this process? causes that then to be kind of cast in stone so we, you know we don't risk you know a chasing a moving target well the housing needs analysis adopting the HNA and the HPS which is the second bullet okay thank you mm -hmm. okay seeing no other questions uh, one thing I will add is just because we would be doing these sequentially um, we wouldn't kind of move on and forget about them. So we understand that our role as staff will be to kind of always 
take you guys back. What have we already done? What have we already approved? And keep uh, reiterating that context. Because even if we kind of approve one thing and move on, those, those previous pieces are still important. So um, that'll be a crucial part of all of this is we'll be revisiting this schedule and this work plan over the next two years with regular check-ins. And what's left to be done on the HNA and the HBS? Um, I think, I believe those are mostly done, um, but before we adopt them, there's the chance that a lot of our pipeline projects could be um, completed and taken out of that um, inventory of buildable land and so that those numbers would be tweaked before we adopted it. And would the numbers be tweaked if this 2024 release of updated population no, because we would have already adopted our our document. Okay. Oh, sorry. I, okay, so I had that in 2024 as well, but yeah. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? No. No. All right. Uh, so, Ryan, do we want to move right on into items of interest from planning staff? Um, yes, and I, I don't believe we really have any updates. Um, we okay. just continue to work on all of these items related to our comp plan update in, in addition to everything else. Um, but I did want to reiterate that we are having a booth at the 4th of July, so please come by if you'd like. Um, one of the pieces of our comp plan that we're most excited about is the public engagement. Um, because, you know, obviously we've heard over the years and like any city, it's, it's hard to um, really get out in the community and talk to people, especially when it's not transactional. You know, you know, people get notices about specific developments and they have issues about specific developments and that's usually the context that they're talking to a planner in. And so we're kind of excited to get out there in front of people where it's just kind of open-ended. It's like, come talk to a planner. You know, do you know what a comp plan is? Do you know what the TSP is? Do you have any questions? Um, and so that's really what the, the booth is gonna be all about. Awesome. And that would uh, pretty much also cover the items of interest from planning commission. <laughs> okay, good. Um, did you see this packet already? Um, the Redwood Village packet? Okay, well I might have you take a look at that and see where this packet needs to go. There's some input from the public and some photos and stuff like that about parking. So sure. pass it your way sure. for evaluation. Okay. I have one question. Oh, go ahead. Walnut Street. Walnut Street, um, we just, <laughs> um, on Friday, we just sent off a package of stuff to ODOT. Um, like Don mentioned before, we originally thought we had to do a right of access for the connection point onto 99, but ODOT um, decided that we qualified for a quicker process, which is a, I'm, I'm probably going to butcher this, I think it's a indenture of access process. Um, the, the right of access, I think, is four to six months, and so this is going to be um, a lot shorter, which is good. Um, I know you're anxious to, to see it done out there. Um, but there is still a review uh, with ODOT, so it's in their court now. We've paid our fees, we have all our applications in, and so that's the um, where we are right now in the process. And then once that's blessed, then we can um, proceed with uh, finalizing the engineering and design and everything. Okay, any other opens? Any other questions? Okay. Uh, I will entertain a motion to adjourn for the evening. I second. You want to make a motion? I would like to, yes, move, I move to, I've never done it before. Yep. What do I say? You're, good. You're doing great. What do I say? I have no idea. Oh. You would move to adjourn for the evening. I move to adjourn for the evening. Do we have a second? A second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. We are adjourned Aye. for the evening. Thank you, Camby. <laughs>